So you should all know me by now. I'm Adam Franti. Uh, I'm from Lansing, Michigan. That's what my shirt says. Uh, and part of what I do is study the cultural history of armies and the military, that kind of thing. So uh, you've all probably heard most of this, with the exception of like the other instructors, because I've told this to all of you in various bits and pieces as you were marching around as your helpman, right? So for a couple of groups of you, I talked about the realm. Right? This is the way that, that mercenary companies generally tend to solve their problems, is they get into a big clump and they surround somebody on a horse and they yell at them until they get what they want, is basically what's going on here. So this is actually from a, uh, a military treatise that was written in the mid-16th century, written by a guy named Leonhard Franzberger. Franzberger has a number of little woodcuts in here, and there's like five or six of them just repeated throughout the book. Um, but a lot of them have this kind of thing. There's no battle scenes in that book. They're all scenes of like camp life, forming up the round, doing things like that. So I like this one because this is sort of what we're gonna be talking about. We're not gonna be talking about combat. We're not gonna be talking about breaking pike formations and stuff like that. We're gonna talk about how the culture of armies, the culture of military actions, revolves around the culture of uh, militias, artisans, and craft work and that sort of thing, right? Um, so we'll, the normal typical thing, if you have any questions, uh, save them to the end, unless you desperately want to know right away, then you can raise your hand, just, you know, whatever. So, all right, next slide, please. I think you have to hit it a couple times to get it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna find some terms first. So over there is a lens uh, This is an etching by Albert Dirk. Uh, he has a number of etchings about Lundsnack, and I like this one because this dude just looks so, super hip. He's ready because it might be raining. So <laughs> he's ready for that, right? Anyway, um, so all of you have probably heard this. So when I'm talking about a Lundsnack, what I mean is uh, a mercenary, right? These are not soldiers. Soldiers are a very different and legally distinct thing than mercenaries. Mercenaries are different, right? Uh, part of this is the recognition that mercenaries are essentially private contractors who have rights, whereas soldiers don't. Once you join an army uh, around the 17th, 18th centuries, once armies became run by the state, you don't have rights. And the difference between a mercenary and a soldier is that you can hang a soldier from just about anything. A mercenary, if you hang a mercenary, his buddies might get really pissed off and then mute, right? And that to us, sometimes or to military historians looking back looks like chaos. It's a complete disorderly way of ordering violence, right? Uh, but the thing is that like, that's how it worked because the only way that you could form armies at this time was just by going to local towns and recruiting people who were already competent fighters who already have their arms and armor and all you really have to do is like issue them replacement pikes because pikes break all the time. Or what also happens very often is that you're issued this perfect pike Somebody's done a bunch of math and decided an 18 and a half foot pike is the perfect length. And then soldiers will, as soon as you're not looking, will break it in half because it's easier to carry a pike that's only nine feet tall rather than 18 feet tall. That happens very commonly, right? So these are people who will do what they want. Uh, they will, you know, again, pillage all the villages nearby and steal all the chickens. We've all heard this repeatedly, right? Uh, but that's, so when we're talking about mercenaries, uh, that's what we mean. The soldiers almost didn't exist in the 16th century. They started kind of becoming a thing by the end of the century, uh, and it was actually in the Low Countries, and fighting in the, basically the, uh, the Dutch Revolt, is when you start seeing soldat, start replacing the various terms they have for fighting men uh, that they use in various ways. So if you read the introduction to uh, Forgang's translation of Meyer's book, it was written in 1570, Meyer never uses the word soldier. He uses horse and foot. He uses, uh, um, the, I think, Kriegsleute, or once or twice. These are all just vague terms for people who fight. They're not soldiers. That's a very, very different thing. And that's the biggest thing I want to impress upon you uh, at this point, right? Um, so, uh, go back. <coughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, so a couple of big things, right? So we've talked a little bit in our, our drill housing about campaign communities, right? And a campaign community is essentially your housing and to a larger extent your army. And the fact that you are a bunch of strangers from not around that area who are now coming to towns that can't possibly support the number of people that you have 
means that you almost always have a very contentious relationship with the townsfolk in the country through which you're marching, right? Uh, and I'm avoiding saying civilians, right? Because if we don't have a military and we don't have soldiers, then we also don't have civilians because a civilian is defined by being not a soldier. And if we don't have soldiers, we don't have civilians. Everybody is townsfolk or they're fighting people or they're Lonsknecht or whatever, right? Uh, and before we go on, right, my preferred <coughs> translation of Lonsknecht is country goon or goon from around the countryside, right? Knecht, it means servant. It means servant in a variety of different ways and in different dialects, but for the most part, when you use the word kent, you're, you're referring to like an armed servant, a goon, a thug, right? So, Lons is just the country, the countryside. <coughs> Goons from around the countryside, that's what a Lons kent is, right? That's it. It's a little flippant, but also like, nobody liked Lons kent. That's why they're banned from Fechula. That's why you don't want them around. It is supposed to be a pejorative term, but it just literally just means a mercenary, a guy who's in an army. Right. Um, so campaign communities, it makes it makes you have this this sense of comradeship, this esprit de corps that you have only with the people as part of your helping, and you're it's you against the world. And I know I told you all of this uh, when we drilled this morning, but that's again the kind of mindset that you would have as a mercenary, right? Uh, and the most important thing is that they're always strangers everywhere they go, uh, and the. The way we kind of talk about like bigotry and racism and hatred today revolves around those particular things, right? We talk about hatred as being racial or hatred as being bigotry or whatever. The most important distinction in the 16th century was whether or not you were <coughs> around here or not. Strangers are the basis of all of that stuff. And if you're a stranger, then we might, we might deal with that by, by saying, well, we don't like you because of your race or your skin color or your religion or whatever. But it starts at bottom is they are not part of your community. And your community is the only thing that matters. So if you're forming up a mobile community whose job it is to go fight wars, then you are literally fighting against the entire world. It's just you and no one else, right? So that being perpetual strangers is why Lance Connect are disallowed at factual level. And things like that, right? It's not because they're super badass warriors who are gonna go mop the floor with all these townsfolk. It's because they're strangers and they take <coughs> trouble. And because they're just going to march away tomorrow. So if they come in and break somebody's teeth by punching somebody with a pommel and effectual, you can't do anything about it because they're gone. And, right, and then you're going to have to chase them down and try to arrest a guy who is surrounded by a bunch of goons who they might not like him, but they're certainly not going to let like some party from Nuremberg come and take the rest of you know, this guy who, who walks around with them, right? So it's an important distinction to think about, and that's going to color just about everything that we're going to talk about when we talk about sacking cities and pillaging the countryside and things like that, right? We don't care about those people. We're marching away from them tomorrow, and they have food, and we haven't been fed, right? And it's been kind of a meme that we've talked about all weekend, but it's a very real part of the mercenary experience. So I, how many of you did what I asked the first day and have not ate? <laughs> right? <laughs> well, you, you're all, you've all failed. You're all terrible on <laughs> This probably speaks to your character. Uh, next one, please. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we form a mercenary army, right? So uh, an army is, is composed of various haufen, heaps, right? Literally heap. Uh, and a haufen is organized essentially by somebody, a client, <coughs> needs to form an army. There's no standing military. Uh, in the Holy Roman Empire around this time, there was what they called the Swabian League. The Swabian League was a group of cities and noblemen who just paid into a, a, a basically a pot, and that pot paid for keeping some mercenaries embodied all the time. These were not the same guys. You didn't just go join the Swabian League and then go to boot camp and then you were in the Swabian League. It was like they had a contract with a mercenary company for a year or two. Maybe they renewed it next year. Maybe they got a different one. That kind of thing. So there's no standing military. You can't just go tell soldiers to do stuff. Cities are protected by civic militias. Uh, most people, if you, are, if you are a citizen within a city, not everybody who lived in the city would be a citizen. There are a lot of strangers that lived in cities. But if you were a citizen, that meant you had a job with a guild, unless you were in Nuremberg, because they got rid of guilds because they had a rebellion, and then the patricians took over and said, no more guilds. But they still had a civic militia. Um, so the whole reason that this process works, the whole reason that you can recruit a mercenary army at the drop of a hat is because everyone in the Holy Roman Empire, every citizen in the Holy Roman Empire, has armor, has arms, probably practices with them, and is probably pretty good with them. So when you go to 
you, you have to go, you know, you know, bang the drummer on the countryside to recruit the goons, and you've probably got a bunch of people who are pretty well armed, pretty well armored, and have quite a lot of experience as a fighting. <coughs> it doesn't necessarily mean they're great at campaigning, because that's a different skill, but they're at least competent fighters, and you don't have to give them basic drill maneuvers and stuff like that, because they've all done that, serving in civic parades and as part of civic militias. Um, so this, this universal militia obligation is basically like the, the ocean on which the boat of armies floats. You can always recruit more goons because the entire country is formed around martial training. Everything has martial flavor. And when I talk about training, I don't mean, again, regiment to drill all the time. I mean factual. Dicking around with your friends, wrestling with your buddies every time you have a, have a chance, going to, to, to fairs in different cities, and going to shooting festivals. Sometimes these shooting festivals, so you know, Frankfurt on Main had their, their fest every year. Uh, there were other cities who would drag their cannons over to Frankfurt and they would have shooting competitions with the cannon teams. And this is just something that you do in your daily life. Most of the people doing that probably would never join a mercenary army. Um, and sometimes uh, civic militias would embody the fight in wars. Uh, in Nuremberg in 1502, uh, or 1499, there was a Nuremberg contingent as part of the uh, imperial invasion into Switzerland in 1499. Uh, and it was actually led by a very famous patrician in Nuremberg named Gilbold per Perkheimer, who actually wrote a history of the Swiss War in which he discussed <coughs> none of the details about the Nuremberg contingent at all, to my great disappointment. Um, so the, the way that you recruit this is, let's say, Maximilian uh, has not been crowned emperor yet, and he's really salty about it. He really wants to be crowned emperor, but, but to do that, you have to go to Rome. So rather than just like getting on a horse and riding to Rome, uh, he would recruit an army because around the time there was this great big conflict going on that we now call the Italian Wars. And essentially, if Maximilian went into Italy, he would get captured and then the empire would have to ransom him. Or what's more likely is that a bunch of people would try to ransom him and not have enough money, and the rest of, of the dukes in Germany would say, eh, tough luck. <laughs> right? Anyway, he never got there. He several times tried to recruit armies to get to Rome, and they almost all just expanded halfway through because he ran out of money. Because armies are expensive. You have to pay everyone, every day, a certain amount of money, and you have to feed them. Sometimes you pay them in clothing. You have to give them weapons and stuff. It's super expensive. Uh, and that's mostly why, when we talk about indiscipline, that's mostly the root cause of most of the indiscipline. Is because when we talk about indiscipline, we mean not doing what you're ordered to do, not, not beating up peasants. Because beating up peasants is just what's happening. That's not, uh, that's not indiscipline, right? That's just what happens with an army, because armies are bad. And most of these guys are just hungry. Anyway, I've got a client. The client says, I need an army. So if, I want you to kind of think about, if, you, if any of you right now needed to form an army, you needed a couple hundred goons to go do something goony, what would you do? Well, we're all HEMA people. So what you probably do is contact people that you know that have really big problems. <coughs> and you'd say, like, you got any goons who want to come with me and we're gonna go we're gonna go rough up the CFG, right? <laughs> 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 right? And so then uh, you know I'd talk to James and I know James is probably down and I'd you know talk to Zeke and the, I'd find people that I know who I know are competent people who can do the hard job of maintaining an army on the move, right? And they're going to recruit people, and they're going to find guys. And I talked to a few of you about this this morning, but uh, Gottsman Blickingen, who is a, a, a knight who wrote an autobiography in the 16th century, talks about this procurement system. Uh, when he's released from house arrest in the 1540s, uh, he joins up an army trying to march to uh, Budapest to, raise, to lift a siege in Budapest. And they get halfway there, half of them die of dysentery, and they're not paid, and it's a really sad thing. But what Guts does when he gets out of house arrest, he just sends a couple of letters, and then suddenly there's like 500 people that want to ride with him. And this is how that worked, right? You just find influential people, and they go, you know, bang the drum around the countryside, and they recruit some goons. Alternatively, you get your musicians in their most fabulous clothing, and they go to the <coughs> cities if they're allowed into the cities, which they often aren't. They go to a tavern outside the city, and they bang the drum, and they try to lure people into joining the mercenary army, as many as they can. Uh, once people know that there's an army recruiting, suddenly a bunch of young men who don't really have a lot of direction in life or whatever might come and join the army, right? So you have, let's say you have 20 to 30 people, most of them have armor and weapons, and then somebody shows up who doesn't. You're not going to hire that guy because 
Well, he doesn't even have weapons. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give him stuff. We're not gonna issue the uniforms and weapons and stuff to people. They already have them. They already have the skills we need. We just need some goons to go to Rome, right? Um, so the reason people might join is because of pageantry, adventure, and obviously the promise of, of fame and the, the promise of probably loot. That's most of what you think you're gonna be doing when you're in an army, is looting the countryside, pillaging. This is the way the economy of an army worked, is they literally called it the pillage economy, at least historians call it the pillage economy. It's because that's how you have to feed yourself, because nobody's giving you food every day. It's a logistically impossible task in the 16th century. There's just not enough food that can be stored long enough to support an army on the move. So you forage, right? And foraging is just a nice way of saying beating up the peasants and stealing their food. If those peasants are lucky, they might be paid for it, but mostly probably not, right? Um, so you have a client, right, who hires the army. You have a military entrepreneur. Uh, that's a term I'm borrowing from David Parrott, who wrote a book called The Business of War, which is all about how this economic lack of a system worked and the credit networks that were necessary to run armies and how, how armies were attempted to be paid and, again, very often not paid at all, right? but it floats on this sort of network of credit. And if we think about sort of networks of credit and how they kind of work today, that's, and we think about that in a social sense, that's how armies are recruited. Because you have a guy who calls some guys, and then they have other guys show up, and then you've got an army, right? Um, and then, so the entrepreneur is the person who forms up the army, and then they are bound by a contract. So this is the same type of contract that the word condottieri comes from, so condotta, uh, just means a, a contract uh, for an army. So there's a military entrepreneur hiring an army. They're the guy te technically in charge of that portion of the army. And the way that that works together when they're marching around and everything, it's very, very, very complicated. But essentially that's how you go, right? There's already a bunch of people who, are, who already have the skills and equipment necessary <coughs> to be part of an army. And you just put them in the same spot and then march them toward Rome. And hopefully you get there this time. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Thank no, you. I <coughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about how a Haufen works, right? So we all know that Haufen literally means heap. And I, I like that term because it, 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 again, just like country goon, has the right connotation, <coughs> right? Armies are mistrusted, they're not lightened, they're made up, it's a heap of men. It's a pile of men. There's no order or structure or organization to part of this is the idea. Of course there is, right? It's very complicated. So rather than having uh, something like specific ranks and like, you wouldn't like join as a private and then get promoted to corporal and then promoted to sergeant. That's not really how it worked. A sergeant is essentially a field marshal in the sense that they marshal the field. A sergeant is responsible for putting their alpha where it needs to go and giving commands. So when we elected our sergeants, when we did our sort of drill portion uh, this morning or yesterday, Right? That literally the sergeant is doing what the sergeant's job was. So we don't we think of them now as like a non-commissioned officer, but everyone in a mercenary house is a non-commissioned officer. There's no officers because there is no commission, because there's no state that is running the army. You just have a bunch of guys. The guys mostly are probably tradesmen. And we'll get to that in a moment, but that's important, right? So the command part of the uh, the Haufen is run by a captain. The captain has a lieutenant, they're in charge, that's it. That's it, those two guys. Then you have uh, six aides. So the captain has four aides and the lieutenant gets two. And those aides are kind of like, I think like the headquarters company, they're like couriers. They're people that go and make sure that like stuff's getting done and they take reports from people, right? It's staff work. Um, super important, it's really important. Uh, people kind of tend to overlook staff work and how important it is to like the functioning of a modern military, but it's critical. Um, and so those aides were probably some of the most important people in the army, and they probably would have been considered like officers uh, in the sense that we kind of think of them today, right? And then of course there's four sergeants. So four sergeants probably implies, although we don't know, it could be different, <coughs> that there are at least four kind of little halfins within the bigger halfin, right? That are, that are rolled around the border. Um, there's a, a current sort of, um, you can look at different armies and the way they're formed today and different armies approach uh, sort of small unit structure in very different ways, and a lot of it revolves around the idea of how many people <coughs> one person can give commands to on a battle. 
and different countries approach this in a very, very different way. And one of the things I was trying to impress on all of you as we're kind of going through our drill evolutions and whatnot is that there is no regular structure for this in the 16th century uh, at all. And so you can have an army made of 16 different halfen, and they can all be doing the same drill stuff 16 different ways. And as long as it gets done, and as long as they're doing the thing they need to do, it's fine. But that to us today sounds like total chaos because that's not a way to run an army. Of course it is, because an army stays together for a couple of months and then it disbands. That's what armies do. It's not a military. It doesn't stay like this. Anyway, so that's the sort of the command structure of the Halpin. And then you have a, a bunch of people that I call masters, right? This is, if you're familiar with like the Royal Navy, like you watch like Master and Commander and stuff, they have like foreign officers. That's kind of what these guys are. But they're, they're all called masters because they are all tradesmen. So you, um, your master gunner is called a master, not because he's you know, a master of cannoneering, he's just in charge of the cannons, right? Uh, he's a skilled tradesman whose trade is cannons, right? He's in charge. He probably has like a mate, like an apprentice, and these people would also be considered kind of like officers in a military today, right? Uh, so we have a master gunner, a wagon master, the master of the watch, the paymaster, the master of spoils, whose job it is to divvy up all the stolen chickens and make sure everybody gets their fair shake, uh, and also the loot, like when you're looting the papal vault in 1527, the master of spoils decides who gets what, who gets to wear the Pope hat, who gets to march around in the sedan chair. You'll see that <laughs> in a moment of time. Um, uh, and then we have quartermasters, and the quartermasters are in charge of the kitchens. So this structure, all comes from a document that was written during the German Peasants' War. This is not actually a mercenary structure. This is the structure of the peasant rebel army, who is structuring it based on the structure of mercenary army. So this is the same thing. This is the way the rebels organize themselves, because this is the way that you organize an army. Because it's a cultural thing, it's not a thing that is regimented or regular. This is just the way you organize. And you organize this because this is probably the way that your militia is organized when you need to do parades and stuff, is you have a guy in charge of the wagons. Because when you're doing a parade, you got a bunch of wagons. You gotta show off all the cool, sick loot you got. Um, and then there's a sort of a section for like order and obedience, right? So we have a provost. A provost is kind of like a military policeman. Their job is to maintain <coughs> order and march. And then you have the musicians and the drummers and the pipers. They relay orders. Uh, they play jaunty tunes as you're marching around. Uh, they're a really critical and important part of this whole system. Um, sorry. Sorry, sorry you, you skipped over mates. So mates are kind of like all of these people would probably have people who work for them. So like the quartermaster's mate, we might call it in like a royal navy ship. They probably wouldn't use the term. They're mostly like apprentices, but they're sort of like the master gunner's second, right? The master gunner is kind of lieutenant, the person who, who takes over if he leaves or whatever. Mate, um, in so the British sense, not the American, not the. Uh, Right, but yes, they're not, it's not buddies, right? Yeah. It's like, it's the master's mate, sort of a thing, right? Yeah. All right, next slide, please. Oh, that's just, uh, that's the bad war. That's another version of the bad war, that's all. Um, so when we think of, of mercenaries, actually, I remember what, why that's in there. Uh, go back one image, please. So this is mostly what we think of when we think of mercenaries, right? Or, or Lonsknecht. We think Lonsknecht, or if you Google Lonsknecht, one of the things you're probably going to see is a version of this artistic topos, this this mess, this bad war in the middle of, of you know whatever. On the shirt that we have for this uh, weekend, you have one that was a battle on the ice, um, and you can see people with little ice cleats sticking up from a hole in the ice because they fell through uh, <laughs> right on the, the bottom print of the shirt. This is mostly what we think about, but if we go to the next image, a more accurate image for what a Lonsknecht army is is probably this. It's wagons. It's supplies. It's marching. You're going to spend so much more of your time marching and thinking about your next meal than you ever are going to spend on a battlefield. Orders of magnitude, like 100 times, right? And that's really critical to understand because we think of, we like, think, we like looking at military history as a sequence of battles and how <coughs> battles and tactics change and whatnot. And that's not really the important part. The important part is making sure you have people who are fed, you have enough wagons, you have food for the horses. Yeah. How much of that marching time is going to a, a certain location, and how much of it is just going to the next chicken coop? Like, uh, well, there that's there. foraging. So uh -huh. no time spent marching is, is marching to loot. That's foraging. Okay. But, uh, I mean, you're marching every day, maybe 10, 15, 20 miles. 
But are they just patrolling around the countryside waiting for something to happen? Or is it that they've... It somebody made a, a tactical decision to yeah. let's go here. It, it depends on what the army is embodied for and what its purpose is, right? So one of the reasons I stress that this isn't a military is because every army is essentially an extension of the purpose of forming that army. So if Maximilian is trying to get to Rome, he needs a slightly different composition of soldiers than he does if he needs men because there's a peasant rebellion, right? And armies, they are embodied for a few months and then they disband. And then the institutional knowledge of that army gets carried on to the next contracts because you have a bunch of guys who are disbanded. They're in the middle of a friggin' Alpine Italian village, and what do they do? They can either go home, plenty of them did. They can try to loot the countryside as they go home, and plenty of them did. But a lot of them would just go on to the next contract. So every single army is probably going to be full of people who have campaigned before on different campaigns who have a little bit of experience. And that sort of shared institutional knowledge is the campaign community, right? So a lot of people would have served in, in something like this for some time, and they would have carried that experience with them. And so this sort of dispersal, right? You have this, this, this sort of cohesion and dispersal, and this pattern is happening all over the place, all over Europe, all the time. And that creates this sort of shared culture among people who call themselves Lanzheim. Yeah. So like, it wouldn't be unrealistic to think of like, the way that this goes down is there's a guy sitting in a tavern drinking a pint of something, yeah. and he hears the flutes and he's like, "Let's go!" And yeah. he like gets up and he goes, "What's going on?" And he's yeah. like, "We're marching a row." And he's like, "Bet, let's go!" Yeah. Right? So yeah. and, and then he just picks up and he's got presumably he has the uh, logistical sort of or the infrastructure to support him not being where he was or yeah. whatever he was doing. That. Yeah. They just pick up the, the pieces of, of him missing, and that, right? yeah. that, that's the kind of way that this went yeah. across the Yeah. Are there any stories of them like getting to the next town, waking up the next morning, going, what the hell am I doing, and just running back home? Probably, yeah. Uh, it's not quite as common as like that. That's something you hear more with like British troop procurement. Mm -hmm. is that there is a, a, a thing that British recruiters very often would do uh, where there's this sort of social ritual of being recruited to the British Army in the 18th century where you, they call it taking the king's shilling. Uh, and you're paid a shilling to join the army. And so one of the ways that unscrupulous recruiters would get men into the army was that you, they'd buy you a drink. And as you drink, you find out at the bottom of your drink is a shilling. And it says you've joined the army. Right? Or they just get you so fucking plastered that you'd wake up on the back of a cart in the army. Right? But the reason that works is because once that happens and that guy tries to leave, you can shoot him. You can shoot him in front of everyone else to tell them that you better not try to run. You can't do that to mercenaries because they, there's no king chilling. There's no state force that's keeping them in body. Right? So you could easily be tricked into joining a mercenary company and then before you sign the contract, you can just say, like, oh, this is a bad idea, we'll go home. I'd rather sleep in my bed with my wife than go to Rome, even if I could leave the paper and, and wear the Pope hat. Right? <laughs> uh, all right, next slide, please. Adam, we have about 10 minutes. Just oh, so Lord. All right, camp followers. This is super important. So I talked about this kind of image here uh, of Alon Snack with his camp life. Uh, camp wives are a completely vital part of the way this whole system works. Uh, they did laundry, uh, and laundry is a critical, important part of the health of people at this time, because people believe that you are dirty and stinky and gross, but if your innermost layer of clothes is clean, then you are clean, right? And they did wash themselves, right? We have this sort of perception of medieval people as water <coughs> losers. Like, public bathhouses in Germany were a huge thing. Anyway, camp followers do a lot of uh, the really important work for maintaining kind of cohesion in the field especially laundry. They aided and were enthusiastic participants of the pillage economy. Uh, and there were stories of like women basically like running these gangs of looters who were going into towns, and she's like looking into the kitchens and saying, that house has a huge stuffed pantry. Let's go loot that one. That kind of thing. So they're a big part of this. And they make up sometimes as much as like a fifth of the total, like if you have 500 fighting men, you have 100 camp followers. And they are sex workers, they're laundresses, they do sewing and tailoring, they do basic medical care, they do everything that we all have vast superstructures to support Army support today is all just done by essentially 
sometimes volunteer, sometimes kidnap women, right? Uh, so they're super, duper, super important uh, to everything. And I'm gonna have to rush through, unfortunately, but next slide, please. Okay, so the structure of the mercenary army is just a whole bunch of halpins all together, right? But we have this hyper-locality, and that's been the whole thing we've been working on this weekend, is you give the command that we need to wheel the entire army to the left, and every halpin within that does their own thing until they form up, right? Uh, everything about this is just super localized. While at the same time, it's also broadly cultural, which means that you're probably solving the same problems in a very similar way, because you're floating on this culture of people who have been on campaigns before who are running things. And they're the important kind of, they're not higher ranked or anything, but people with experience who are telling you where to go and what to do. And probably most of these people would do things slightly similarly, but there's also important differences. Again, it's not a regular system. Um, more or less the, the position of, the, of where they go on the march, um, who gets the, the kind of position of honor on the battlefield and whatnot is all down to like politics, uh, social eminence, right? Uh, if Maximilian is in charge of the army, he's probably got a bunch of noble underlings who are also running things who have jealousies and rivalries among themselves and like politics between the generals and the general staff is again another completely ubiquitous part of military history that most military historians are just like, well that's not important because let's get to the tactics, right? This is the important part of an army. It's especially in this period, armies are just the extension of politics. And that ne that doesn't stop just because you're in the army and you might have to fight a battle. It actually intensifies when you might have to fight a battle because if you're in a position of prominence and do something badass, that's going to lead to untold uh, prominence afterward, right? Um, next slide, please. All right, so training, I'll just talk about a little bit. We tend to think of it more like this. Right? There's big blocks of people marching and <coughs> together and, and walking around. But if you go to the next uh, image on the slide, mostly what training is is this stuff. It's factual. It's it's running, leaping, throwing, running around, being attacked by snakes. <laughs> that's uh, that's a sort of a comic figure that's at a lot of factual. Who's uh, yeah? Joe is around. <laughs> what the hell? How come I can use you? I had you all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so this sort of individualized practice, uh, this sort of dicking around with your friends, is the way that most people were trained. And it's the fact that this is going on pretty much every weekend in most cities. Not everybody all the time, right? But like every city in Europe would have a big festival at least once a year, probably. And those big city festivals are a real big chance for you to show off how cool you are. And so this is happening all over the place. And the fact that this is happening all over the place enables this system of ad hoc armies that are assembled at the jump and just march to Rome, get there halfway, and then stop because they ran out of money, right? But it's the fact that all, all men are doing this all the time, so they have the martial skills that you need to be in an army. That's, that's how training works. And then individual drill stuff that you would do basically as you were marching, you figure out on the go, and if most of your people are people who've served in campaigns or have been in uh, militias that do regular drill, everybody knows what they're doing anyway. That stuff's easy. You might do things like specialized training for specific tasks. Say that you need to batter down the door into a castle. Well, now you need a, a battering ram team, or you need like a cannon position in a dangerous spot, so you ask for volunteers. Once you ask for volunteers, you say, you're gonna get paid double for doing this. A double soldier. That's all that means. It's not a special guy with a big sword. It's just a guy who's paid more for doing a specific thing, or it could even be like the cook. It could just be like a guy who has a particular skill that's valuable in the in the uh, army, and he's paid double. That's it. Doppel Zoldner is something from the 17th century, not the 16th. Uh, it has nothing to do with swinging a big sword. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so mutiny and discipline. Uh, this is a really so that's 1527 the sack of Rome. That's a woodcut. This guy here is not the Pope. That's just a, a mercenary wearing the Pope's. <laughs> and this guy down here has a coat hat, right? They looted the papal vaults in 1527, and they marched around the city as they were rioting and pillaging and looting and burning on the, city, on the Pope's sedan chair, just goofing off, right? And they did this because they hadn't been paid. At, at, the, at, the, 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 at the bottom of every troop mutiny, uh, under the sort of mercenary system in history, is the fact that these guys have not been paid. Because 
armies aren't really good at fighting wars, uh, and politicians are even worse at paying soldiers for their failure to fight wars. These guys have not been paid. Uh, these wives were supposed to protect the city of Rome. And they hadn't been paid, and they said, we're not going to marshal out there and fight unless you fucking pay us. And they said, we got no money, so they took the money from the city of Rome. Right? That's why that happened. It's not because they're just a bunch of, you know, goons and murderers. They are, but they also hadn't been paid. If you pay them, they're only going to murder the people that you want them to, rather than the people they're supposed to protect. Right? Uh, and that's, I wanted to talk a lot more about mutants, but I don't have any time, so you have to ask me after. But, uh, next slide, please. All right. Uh, the disbanded mercenary is something we've talked about a little bit in our little health and training, too. The problem is, when, once you have this system of, again, you sort of make this little this concentration of men, march them somewhere, and then you tell them, we don't have any money, good luck, and that's the system, you have roving bands of hundreds of armed men who are now at loose in the countryside. They don't have officers in charge of them anymore. They're just a bunch of robbers and thieves. So this is a, a painting from the 17th century Dutch master called Peasants Fighting Soldiers. The peasants look like they're having the better of things in this one too. That guy is getting his armor cut off and is stabbed in the neck. It's pretty bad, right? This is another reason why every city has a militia. You might not be fighting wars a lot, but you might have to run off a bunch of Lanskanaks who are trying to steal everybody's chickens. And that's probably something you're going to do way more often than you're going to try to drill and fight on a battlefield, right? This is why you need a bunch of armed men who are watching out for their community, because anyone who is a stranger is a threat, right? And when we think about it this way, a lot of this makes a lot more sense than just like, oh, well, they never drilled because they're bad soldiers. But that's not their job. Their job is to protect your town and city from roving bands of murdering rapists who were just been disbanded because they hadn't been paid. And because they hadn't been paid, they're hungry, and they want to steal your money, and they want to carry off your daughter, and they want to eat all of the food that you have. So you have to organize yourself to protect yourself against this, right? Um, so that's a really important aspect of this that is often not discussed by military historians, but it's a severe, huge problem. And one of the ways that you solve this problem is just having another contract ready to go. That might be for the other side of the conflict that you're fighting. It might just be a different army uh, paid by a different guy. It could be anything. But having these roving bands of disbanded soldiers is a huge, huge, huge problem. And it essentially is it's a big uh, problem during the, the Thirty Years' War in the mid-17th century. Uh, and it is basically 30 years of roving, disbanded criminals wandering the countryside. Yeah. And do we know, do we have any idea how common it was to get paid or not get paid? I don't know. Okay. I'd have to, I'd have to like, look and, and, like, do some statistics. Sure. Because yeah. we know plenty of armies did get paid. <coughs> yeah. Right, right. Whether they accomplished what they were supposed to do is another question entirely. Sure. But getting paid was also looting and sacking your your right. towns and before it came. So uh, running very out of time. So next slide, please. <laughs> the next one's the last one. <coughs> Myths and nonsense. Uh, we often see uh, Lonsnack talked about as being the elite, highly trained mercenaries of Maximilian. There's a story from a historian named Charles Oman, uh, who I also wanted to talk to or talk about more at length. Charles Oman was a Prussian school historian. And the Prussian school is the, uh, well, a bunch of Prussians said basically, we, we have perfected war. Uh, how did we get to this point? And they went back and studied history and tried to find points where the, the art of war progressed. And so Charles Oman is looking at Landsknecht as something where the Swiss had a really good idea. So Maximilian borrows the ideas from the Swiss and then trained his mercenary bands to be just like the Swiss. And we know that didn't happen because the Germans already were doing that. The only thing they did was he just gave them pikes instead of helmets. That's it. They're just goons. They're just goons. That's that's all they are. So we've already talked about Babel Zoltner. We've already talked about Mexican <coughs> shock troops and the evolution of the rifle operator. That's it. Right. <laughs> um, any last question? Yeah. So like thinking about like you know, main first period is like a career in quotes, right? Like what mm -hmm. happens when you get too old to fight? Like, Hopefully you have family to take care of you. Hopefully you've got a cousin or an uncle or a brother or something that can put you up. You heard um, the flutes and you said, ah, I'm all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you could also work in what we might call like an administrative position, 
right? So like, Alzheimer Lickingen was, was riding in campaigns in his 60s, right? And he was fit and healthy and rich, so that helped. But there are plenty of people like that, but there was no real retirement plan. But there were communities, right? So if you were somebody who had a good community back in your hometown, you just go back to your hometown and they'd take care of you, right? And churches and like, they didn't have like, you know, social security or anything like that or retirement plans, but they had much tighter knit communities, right? So like you just go back to where you were at home, hopefully, hopefully. And you know, it's impossible to say with, with any kind of universality, but that was fairly common, I would, I would expect. Yeah. Uh, just sort of given what we know about the challenges of pre-industrial agriculture, how much better or worse would you say the average mercenary standard of living was than say the average farmer? That's an interesting question. I would probably say a long time where a mercenary would have it way worse. Uh, you're, you're much more exposed to the elements. Uh, you're, you're away from any kind of center organization that can you know, take care of you when you're sick uh, or whatever. But like, you couldn't pay me enough money on earth to be a mercenary in the 16th century. It, it sounds like an absolute misery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is this something that people would, would do if there was like a lack of opportunity in their own country? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. So I, I talked about this a little bit with a couple of the different uh, groups, but like the people who join mercenary companies are the same kinds of people in the same kind of material conditions who would join, who would become cowboys, or they would like take the pioneer wagon train out west, or they'd become pirates if they're in the Caribbean, or whatever. Or they just join the military today. Or they would join the military today. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and it's, a lot of this is basically like, things like this are expressions of Differ, differing levels of material conditions, right? And that doesn't necessarily just mean the economic stuff. It means things like, if you are a person living in a place who doesn't feel at home, you don't have a community, you're much more likely to join a mercenary company because there's a promise of adventure, there's a promise of, of loot and, and fun and all sorts of things. Your country's been in a civil war for a while and a bunch of lands connect to roll through your village and yeah. take all your stuff. Yeah, and that, that could you be want to be the guy doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Other people's stuff. <laughs> you you that, guys, we're, we're that's right. honestly, <laughs> I'm going to let Adam wrap up his comment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's that's actually, I think, a really sharp uh, perspective, right? Because if you have these bands of you know, roving looters who are wandering the countryside and okay. they uh, they've looted your village, and now you don't have have anything, then maybe you join the next.